And we start with Johan, Johan Lolo here and his panel. Hi Johan, how are you? I'm very good. How are you doing, John? I'm great. I don't know if you saw Johan yesterday. You know, you've been interviewed. Uh, you did interview like Justin Aversano. That was very last minute, though. It that was, <laughs> that <laughs> was <laughs> unexpected, but that was fun. Yeah, you know, I, I, Justin was here, and uh, you know, like he just came here and ten minutes before say, "Hey, where is my interviewer?" <laughs> and I say, "Oh, is there an interviewer?" And at this moment, you know, I found the perfect man, Johan, who was you. there, and I wanted to thank you for that. Too. Oh, pleasure. Thank you so much. And so today, Johan, you have an, a new panel, right? A new panel, a very exciting panel about NFT photography. Uh, I myself am a photographer and I'm passionate and very bullish about NFT photography. So I suggested to John to have this, this great panel about NFT photography. So, yeah. And so I wanted to thank you for that. I wanted to know who's coming. So. Exactly, yes. So I am very excited to be on stage today with three guests. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them uh, each other and I'm going to have them join me on stage. So we have today Ina Moja. Uh, Ina Moja is a photographer. Her photography is inspired by the work of her mentor Malik Sidibe and West African photographers of the 60s like Seydou Keita and Sori Sanle. Uh, she grew up in Bamako and she was fascinated by the natural elegance of the people in the streets, which she loves to capture in sophisticated compositions. She is a UN ambassador and a strong figure for social and climate justice, and she joined the NFT space late in 2020. Ina, Mo uh, Ina Moja, please. please. Thank you. <laughs> you, any way you want. Thank you for this. So we have Ina Moja. Ina Moja, and then we have uh, Monaris. Monaris came from New, uh, from not New York, New Jersey. She's a photographer with a passion for visual storytelling. As an Adobe Lightroom and Sony ambassador, she has developed a distinct creative style focused on composition and color theory that lives to transform brief instances of reality into movie-like scenes. She has partnered with some of the world's most prominent brands and she joined the NFT space late last year, early last year. Thank you very much, Monaris. Thank you, Monaris. And last but not least, we have Jean-Michel Payon. Jean-Michel has been an art collector for more than 15 years already. He has his own art gallery in Paris and he has been following the evolution of the NFT space for more than three years now already, one of the very early collectors in the space. And recently he's been focusing all of his attention on NFT photography. Ladies and gentlemen, Jean-Michel Payon. <laughs> and so, you know, because he didn't introduce himself, but I will do it properly. You know, as a panelist, you have the chance to have Johan Lolo. He was known first, you know, for his beautiful landscape, uh, for his beautiful landscape photographies. And uh, he joined the space, I think, like one year ago, if I'm not wrong. Correct. Uh, going into the NFT space. And, uh, you know, he's a panelist, but it could be also, you know, someone who talk about himself because he has a lot of knowledge, a really nice community. And he's also building this new, uh, this new, uh, like, a curate platform uh, that is quite beautiful actually what is the exact name of the platform? it's uh, nft photographers dot xyz very easy nft <laughs> photographers dot xyz so you know thank you very much for moderating this panel pleasure thank you john the stage is yours thank you all right so before we start into the main topic, which is going to be uh, NFT photography, what is the future for the medium in the metaverse and in the blockchain. I'm quickly going to go back um, about the, the history of NFT photography a and just to show you how quick this space evolves. So basically, I started the NFT, uh, I started to join the NFT space. That was a year ago. Jean-Michel uh, has been there earlier than that, and he will uh, be able to share that. But as I remember, a year ago when I first heard of NFTs, photography, and you guys can confirm, it was not a thing at all. Uh, I remember these great photographers like uh, Mario Testino was one of the very first to join the NFT space as a photographer. And at the time, it was February, March, photography, like selling a proper piece of photograph, was not a thing. And all the photographers had to animate 
the pieces just in order to justify the fact that they were actually selling NFTs. I remember Mar Mario Testino like making animation like zoom in, zoom out, and in one of his very famous Kate Moss portrait uh, to, to, to just sell it on, on Maker's Place. And the evolution of NFT photography went very quick. Just two or three months later, we were just before the summer, uh, we, we saw the, like, some photographers, Justin Abbasano that we saw yesterday here on stage, was one of the very first also to be one of the pioneers minting and selling proper photographs. And if we look back at what happened just before the summer, to today, almost a year later, the evolution has been very, very fast. We saw different kind of hypes. I remember one of the very first general photography that was very successful in the NFT space was landscape, and you can confirm. And then it was like different kind of hypes. First landscape, then it was street photography, then right now it's a bit of, uh, I think it's nude, nude photography is a big thing right now. So. My point here is just to tell you guys that in just less than a year, we saw a huge evol evolution within the NFT photography market. And I'm very, very thrilled and excited and curious to see where we're going over the next six months, 12 months, potentially three, five years. And that's why, why we're here to discuss this with my guests. So very excited. I'm going to ask you that first question to, to the three of you. What, where do you see photography uh, on the blockchain going in the next few months or years? Hopefully, it will, we will be able to see different types of photographies and really the space evolving. Like you said, we started with landscape and now we're more at a, at a spot where we see more nudity and uh, also portraits and um, fashion photography also is something that is present. Hopefully, it will evolve, evolve again as much as uh, uh, new photographers come on board and we are able to really admire and, um, and uplift any kind of photography. Correct. I think um, one thing that we keep saying in this space is we're still early, right? Um, because there's still so many photographers out there that do not understand Web3. And I think it's part of our responsibility to teach them to, um, you know, to, to, to let them know how this space is going to be beneficial for their future. Why? We were having this conversation about licensing. You know, as a photographer, it's so important to value our work. Um, we usually, you know, sell it to clients. Um, they do the licensing. Uh, so it's going to get to a point, I feel like, I think it's going to take a couple years uh, because right now we're in a cycle. That's how it, that, that, this is how it usually works. Um, photography peaked and now it's slowly coming down again. So we, um, myself included, I have to, one thing that I keep telling myself, it's just stay patient. I feel like this space has taught me so much patience. And I say this because like um, you sell one photo Right, um, I sold my, my I sold two of my pieces for eight ETH, so that's my highest sale. Um, so then it's been two months of no sales. So you constantly have to tell yourself like this is okay. It's it's completely normal, you know. So it's a cycle, and I and uh, you know we need to hopefully we, we get more collectors. That's something that um, JM is going to talk about that we need more collectors because there's so many artists and photographers out there, but uh, but not enough collectors to collect our work. So hopefully in, you know, in a couple of years, um, this is going to change and, you know, it's going to be like a balance of collectors to artists and photographers. But right now, it's like we're in this cycle that we're just waiting for it to peak again and, and hopefully it keeps evolving for us. So Jean-Michel, can you tell us why are you so bullish on, on photography? Why, why are you like, you put all your bags almost right now on photography. Can you tell us why? Yes. But first and foremost, I must say that um, usually, I've been a collector before, you know, in traditional art, street art, and photography, uh, analog photography. Um, and when I discovered NFTs, uh, technically speaking, first, and then it took me some while to kind of understand the power of NFTs, and specifically for photo. But I will come on the example later, but to come back to the initial question, which is where I see the photography and NFT going, I think it will be huge. Uh, my bold bet is that between five to 10 years from now, the most famous and most expensive photographers in the world will be NFT photographers. Um, and probably that they will be natively NFT photographers, meaning that you have great photographers in analog. Some of them will do the move to the NFT space. 
But I personally believe that just like we had in crypto art and, and things, the, 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 the biggest players will be the native one. So it's going to be a shift then. It's going to be yes. a shift from the traditional world to NFT, but not specifically the same guy uh, being the same, more successful. Yeah, I, I think that the, the biggest one will be the new one. And it's a question of generations. Mm. It's a question of because of the medium is not the same, because the collectors are not the same, you know? Correct. Uh, you know, we will probably, you know, favor Ina or Monaris artwork against, you know, I cannot quote in name, but famous photographers. Correct. And we want to, as a collector, you know, what, what you want to do when you are a collector is because you like the artwork, because you try to, at least myself, I try to tell a story with my collection, uh, but eventually, as a collector, I'm not a flipper, so I'm selling almost nothing, uh, which is not good for the artist, because then you don't get the royalties, but sorry for that. Uh, but my goal is to <coughs> expand the visibility of the NFT photography, so on the side, I'm organizing exhibition, uh, and probably that one day, not necessarily my collection, but other collectors' collection, will be in museums. Uh, I was talking about that with uh, Bruce Gilden, who is a famous analog photographer that moved into the, uh, the, uh, the NFT world, that actually did very well, the, the, the migration. He did. Uh, and he's in MoMA, for instance. All his uh, photographs are in MoMA. And he was saying, you know what? Next time, it will be your photography that you buy in NFT that will be at MoMA, not anymore my analog one. So voila. That, that's really interesting, and I'd like to, to to ask you, the two of you, that question about exhibition. Like, I'm sure you've been exhibiting your work in like physical galleries or physical uh, places in venues. Have you been already exhibiting your work in like the metaverse or in virtual galleries? Uh, if not, are you very excited about this opportunity? And how do you see the future of exhibition in the metaverse for artists and photographers in general? I think for me, it's, it's very exciting, you know, because I, I, in Web 2, I have, I've had had my work exhibited in real life and everything, but this, the Web 3, it's, you know, since we're all so excited about it and it's so new, it's so, like, immersive, you know? And what happens when collectors have so much work and they can't, like, if they have a place where they can showcase, it, showcase the work and even promote the photographer, even like, you know, I'm bullish on this photographer because I bought the artwork. I think it's something that we're going to see more and more of, like more platforms are going to be like, you know, like we're going to exhibit your work, we're going to do this. So it's going to become like more like a norm, you know, having more access to that, to, to you know, Web3 access. Yeah, to me it was, Super exciting. The first time that I saw my work in uh, the metaverse <laughs> it was uh, something organized by the platform Super Rare, where I was uh, a part of the exhibition with uh, so many photographer friends, and we could just go inside and see the work of other people, and it was really exciting. It shows us it's just a sneak peek of what we are going to be able to do uh, later, and uh, it's super exciting. My work has been exhibited in real life, but now because the space is uh, so exciting and offers uh, possibilities that we haven't even begun to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm super excited about this because uh, visual and photography storytelling is so powerful that I use it uh, with my activism, with my story from where I come from, for, and it, it represents something that is so important to me that uh, I hopefully uh, a lot of people will see the value in it and uh, will come into the space and do the same. Mm, I, I'm not sure if you, if among the work that you've been minting and selling already, uh, is this work has been produced for the NFT space or are they part of some archives? And if, uh, if they're part of archives, are you, are you planning to go and produce and, and go potentially on assignment for some clients or just you for your personal projects, produce something that is just like any photographer would produce work for a book, for a photo book, or for a, a physical exhibition. Uh, would you do that for NFT, for the NFT space, like as you for a, a virtual exhibition or for a proper collection on any, on any marketplace? Would that be something that you would approach differently, the medium and in the way of the way you would produce your work? For example, for me, I have one collection that's called Collecting Hands. Um, it's where I, 
I take photos of people walking with their hands behind their back. And I've been taking photos of that for maybe like six years, right? So when I was trying to figure out what my first collection was going to be, you know, I already had that body of work um, since I've been doing it for so many years. And I was like, okay, this is the perfect opportunity for me to, um, to bring this collection to life and mint it. So I, I did that as my first collection. Um, and the Web3, and it did so well. Um, I remember it sold out in like 15 minutes, and I had no, I, I had no expectations, honestly. I just was like, I love this body of work, and I believed in it, and I, and I did it. And um, so that's, that's something, so I did 30 of them. And like you said, since I've been doing it for so long, I have continued um, to document that and, and gather more hands, because I want that um, collection to grow into something incredible. So it definitely, Web3 has like, pushed me to continue that collection, and it's something that, you know, it motivates me because it's something that was so well-received and so loved that it's like, it feels like a, like a safe space for me to promote that collection. And for me, I have, the work that I've minted so far is work that I have did before, but never showed because I never felt that uh, there was a space that would uh, see the, the full value and the full spectrum of what I was sharing. And, uh, and so that is the work that I choose to mint. But now I'm working on something that is just for the NFT space and tailored yeah. for uh, what I'm doing now. And I like my work to, I like to take time, you know, over the years to build stories and to, you know, um, keep on telling them. And when I'm ready, share them. So. It's, uh, I'll probably still be minting some things that I created a while ago, but uh, as we were saying before, sometimes you feel like you're too early and people won't understand. And, uh, and so some of my work have been sitting there because I felt that uh, it wasn't the right time to show. So I have both coming up. Jean-Michel, yeah. you were, I mean, you, you've been collecting art for a long time, more than a decade, uh, and I know that you've completely shifted to NFT and, and the digital collecting. What do you think of the traditional art world? Do you think there's still room for it? And where do you see it coming? A and why do you think the NFT is a, is a proper revolution of art? Why have you completely shifted to the NFT world? Alors, um, <clears throat> my story is the following. Um, I was collecting analog photography uh, and I you know, I began collecting at higher price. At some point, when you reach a certain price that you pay for photography, you want to know more. Obviously, you, you like the artist, you like the, the, the picture, uh, you, you probably like the story behind it, but you also want to know how many are there. Because you can have the most beautiful photography in the world. If there is 10 edition, 1,000 edition, or 1 million edition, it's not the same enfin, in terms of pricing. You know, If it's 1 million edition, it can be the pretty surf poster that you've got uh, when you're a teenager, but it's a poster. It's not uh, photography art. You know, it's 30 something, 30 edition to be supposed to be um, uh, art photography, I would say. So, and I was about to buy this relatively expensive photography from a very French, very, very, famous, very famous French photographer. Um, and actually, it was kind of written nowhere, but the gallerist told me there is around 100 edition of this in the right. world. OK, around, which is around, not yeah. very scientific, <laughs> but that's cool. Um, and it's signed down you know, at the bottom, uh, bottom right of the, of the photo. And I was kind of intrigued, so I do a bit of research on that. And eventually, I discovered that actually, obviously, this photographer was already dead. But the paper that was used to print it was actually after he was dead. All right. So it didn't match quite well. And so after another you know, inquiry, I basically discovered that some kind of former agent of those guys kept the negatives, and he was still printing it, and he was signing, signing himself. Oh my god. So I said, OK, <laughs> I'm not playing this game. Yeah. Uh, and so fast forward, you know, uh, obviously working for Ledger and working into crypto on the security and technological side of things, obviously when NFT popped up you know, during the summer of 17, I was intrigued from a technological angle, but not yet from an collector and or investor angle. But after a while, I, I, I saw the power, especially with that example, because I said, actually I was explaining exactly that to a friend of mine who is a collector of analog photography, and I said, guess what? With NFT, it cannot happen. Because 
you know when it has been minted, you know by whom, and you know how many editions there is. And there is no way to come back on that and to change it. So for me, it was very powerful. And by saying that to my friend, I kind of overconvinced myself. And that's why I did the move and I said, OK, I will probably never buy again any analog photography and I will only focus myself on NFT photography. That's amazing. Um, I I'd love to discuss with the three of you the something that to me is really revolutionary in the NFT space is the, the relationship between artists and collectors, which is very something I, I believe is completely new because there's no, there's no intermediary anymore. There's no third party anymore. Of course, there's a, there are the marketplaces, but you know, like, I don't know if Jean-Michel has collected the, the, the work of you, but I know Jean-Michel has collected all of the, the work of, of many, and you've built relationships with, with these artists directly, and to the point that you almost become friends with them, and if you want to, like, if you want to, 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 to find a piece and buy a piece from one of your favorite artists, I mean, we all know that everything happens on Twitter right now. It's just like you're just one DM away from your favorite artist, right? So how, how, how is that relationship evolved, and how, how do you... How bullish are you on, on that relationship uh, aspect with the, within the NFT space? I, I think for me, I remember um, one of my very first collectors um, when I first started the space. We became so close so fast. Like he had, he had no idea of you know my Web two, um, what I do in Web two. But he was like, I love your work, right? So we kept talking and we create. We 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 became like friends, right? And I didn't know this collector. And he immediately was like, I want to I wanna be able to help you. And I was like, how come? Like, what should I do? He was like, first off, you need to get your Monaris.eth. And he was like, why is this important? And he started telling me why that was important, right? And then he goes, I think you should have your own smart contract. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, what? And he then began to like explain it to me. He then contacted me to one of his developers, and we began working on my own smart contract. And because of him, now I have a collection under my own smart contract. So it was just like, you don't know people, and they just, you know, they are willing to help you out so much. So because of that first relationship that I, that I you know, that I built <coughs> with him, I learned from it. And I think it's equally important, you know, when someone... Um, it's willing to spend so much money and on your work and on you that you are you, you're supposed to like continue a relationship. Right? JM collected a, a photo of mine, and, and now you know we met like yesterday for the very first time. And you know I am so grateful. So every time someone buys my work, I make sure that I send a message and I continue having like, a conversations. Like I have now so many of so many of my collectors are now my very close friends. And th I think that this is something that was lacking in Web2. Now the, the relationships are stronger. And that's something that if, if you sell your work, or if you don't sell your work, even reach out to collectors. Like, um, I'm pretty sure you get a lot of DMs. Um, but that's something that you have to do. Even like a hello, I'm sure they're overwhelmed as well. So if they don't respond, there's no reason why you should be like, oh my god, they're ignoring me. But I think it's very important to put yourself out there and, and mm. create relationship with collectors. I, what I love is that actually collectors and artists are building together. We're building the ecosystem of photography together and what is, uh, what is the future of that. And I think, to me, you don't have to buy my art, but the fact that you buy the art of other photographers, you're building the space and you're uplifting uh, photographers. And I will always benefit from that because you are bettering the space for everybody. And I've learned so many things just from talking with GM, talking with different people, talking with photographers, collectors who uh, don't own my work or sometimes don't even know about my work. But I learned so much with that from their experience. And uh, it helps me. Uh, same, I, I, I bought my .eth uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I started minting my work, even though I had been in the space for a while. I've never done it. But before, I've been in the space for a whole year before minting my first artwork because I was building something else. And then when I was there, at that moment, I felt like, okay, what should I do? And I had a lot of advices. And um, thankfully, uh, you guys all, ha uh, we're in a group where it's super supportive and super helpful. And, and that's what I really appreciate in the space. It's the, it's the, it's the support and the genuineness of it. Yep. We all know that 
Instagram is working on NFTs, right? What are they coming with? We don't know yet, but I believe, and I'd love to have your opinion on that, I believe that if they implement the NFT marketplace or allowing any user on Instagram to just mint the work, and we're just going to focus here on photography, do you guys think it's going to be very important in the fact that there, there's going to be like a ton of photographers being on board into the space, which means more mainstream and more popularity to get the NFT space more known within more collectors, within uh, just the traditional photography market? Or are you afraid that there's going to be an oversaturation of offer, which is kind of already the case because we like there's definitely more photographers selling that there are collectors buying right now, again, in the NFT photography space. So what is your opinion on, on what's Instagram doing? And, potentially what are the risks or the advantages on that? Well, I would say that um, more talent are welcome, but uh, Instagram is, is not just about, because there are a lot of people who share pictures that are not theirs. So my question would be, how do you, the ownership of the photography, how are they going to manage that? Mm. Because anybody can share anything, today right. and not credit the photographer. My work have been shared, my photos have been shared without crediting me. And how is that going to happen? And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm bullish on talent. And uh, if any uh, talented photographer wants to enter this space and make a living and share his art, they're welcome. But just uh, Instagram was not meant for this, so how are they going to remodel it for just NFTs? I don't know, and um, I'm looking. I'm, yeah, I'm looking. You're curious. I'm curious. Jean-Michel, yeah. what do you think? I, I don't have a, a proper answer to that, but I think that the DNA of Instagram, as you know, is very Web2, centralizing everything. You guys know that when you, exact, exactly the example you, you gave, and also if I take a picture of you guys over there, I put on Instagram, and you know, it's not even my, my own photo. You know, it becomes Instagram photo somehow. Yes. So for me, it's kind of antagonic, you know, uh, in the sense that Web2, very centralized, Web3 being totally decentralized, which is really the purpose of it, right? And exactly as you said, you need to own, you know, the photography to, to be the, the, either you are the creator or the collector. And I don't really know how, how they can do that. So technically speaking, I don't know. But in terms of ad adoption, if they do something, they will probably have to change their model. They are very big, very powerful. So there are positive side that they could bring millions of people into NFTs, which is good. And, but I'm still kind of struggling myself to understand how technically they can do it without disrupting themselves, mm. which by essence in technology uh, never happen. Because when you are kind of incumbent, you usually have big difficulties moving into the next uh, you know, round of uh, innovation. I, I, I believe that if Instagram becomes a big marketplace, it's going to be just a huge mess, but <laughs> a necessary mess for the onboarding and for the mainstream of the NFT. And you know, Instagram, I, I don't know about Ina, but I know Monaris and myself, we, we've been on Instagram for almost a decade now. Uh, and, and that helped a lot of artists, emerging artists, to just make a living out, out of their work. And I believe that the NFT space is even more important than what Instagram has played as a role for these emerging artists. Because when, you, when we look at the traditional art world, there's a lot of things which are wrong there. Which, to me, the number one thing is the elitism that happens there. And the fact that to be exhibited in art galleries, most of the time it's about who you know or how big you are. It's all about networking. While with the NFT space, uh, I really see a huge opportunity for, for emerging artists, wherever they are coming in the world or who, how, how big they are, to just showcase their work and find potential new collectors that haven't really necessarily been collecting art before, but they're just like, Everyone starts from scratch. We're literally building a new world here, and, and a lot of new artists will have this chance to, to show the talent to new collectors who are themselves discovering this new world. So what is your take on this? Anyone wants to talk? I mean, like, I, I have so many things to say about Instagram. You know, I, I've, I've been prior to Web3, 
Um, I, I was able to make a living off of Instagram. I, I quit my job in, back in 2017 because I always say that I, that I took a leap of faith because I, I was like, you know, I need to try. And it was because of Instagram. Instagram opened so many doors for me. Um, so I have like a love-hate relationship with Instagram. We all do. Uh, <laughs> yes, like I hate it. Like sometimes I like hate you, but then others I'm like, oh my God, because of you, you know, now I have my own business and I've been able to, to do so much. Uh, so it, I think I read somewhere that in terms of licensing and how do you know if your photo is yours, I think Adobe is working on something that they're trying to implement. Um, when you open one of your photos in I think Lightroom or Photoshop, that you are going to be able to, to make sure that it's yours. Like something is going to happen that it's going to... Um, They've been working on that with Behance. Uh, hand something, with yes, Behance, yeah. correct. And then when you post your... You're going to be able to po uh, post your photo through, that, through the app or something like that, and it's going to be able... To, that's how somebody's going to know that that's actually your photo. Uh, but like you said, it's... It's terrifying because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, like if, if it's going to work, if it's going to... Already people are kind of like worry about like NFTs, like what is that? Like I don't understand it. And if maybe it's going to be good and they're going to be like, okay, this is actually... I, we understand what's happening. Or it's going to just be like an oversaturation of, of, of just everything because that's usually what it happens with a lot of things. It's just like it starts off a couple, a couple of people and then it's just like a bunch of others. And so it's definitely something that I think about all the time. Like I would love to continue um, using Instagram. I, you know, I, I, I usually post every day. So while I'm building, I'm continue building on, on Web 2, then it's like on Web 3, I'm doing the same thing. So it's, a, it's like I'm trying to find a balance of the two of them. But if, if we're able to bring them, both of them together, then that would make a lot, you know, easier for, for, for everyone. So right now we, we're in that NFT bear market and, and we, Mostly photographers kind of, we're not suffering, but we see that it's harder to get sales, definitely more than it used to be like late uh, last fall. Uh, Jean-Michel, do you, where do you see, I mean, we don't have a proper answer, no one knows the future obviously, but yourself as a collector, do you think like photography is, go, is be gonna become more and more popular within the, and I include every NFT collectors, whether they are from the PFP projects or any kind of art, or the kind of art, do you really see them entering the NFT photography space and getting more and more interested? Because let's be honest, photography is such a small niche right now in the NFT world, right? And, yeah. and I've been trying to understand why, why there are not so many collectors interested in that so far. And, and one of the reasons that I might have found, but again, I'm not sure, would that be because of most of the photographers right now, they are selling and minting archives where, compared to other artists producing work for the NFT. When you, look, when you think of any, any, all the big successful artists in the NFT world, they're producing exclusive and new content for the NFTs. But that's just my take. I'm just trying to understand why. Uh, Alors, so <clears throat> there are two questions in there. Um, so I believe that right now what is happening, what we call bear market, is simply because there's a an, un an imbalance between the quality uh, of the supply of art, so lots of great art photographers uh, in NFT space, and indeed there are not so many uh, NFT photographer uh, collectors. So that's you know the basic thing right now, and because we had many very qualitative artists coming, basically there's always this balance between supply and demand, and simply there is you know. There is no meeting because there are more supply and demand. That's as simple as that for now. Now, how can we work on the supply? Uh, not on the supply, sorry, on the demand. Correct. So, uh, how we can bring new collectors to that? So, as you said, you know, probably six, nine months ago, you know, NFT photography was a kind of niche into the overall NFT space. It was a sub-segment. But now, I think that even people that are not collecting photography, they still acknowledge the fact that it's a segment on its own. And when you see all the taxonomy within the NFT, you always have NFT photography. So at least it exists and it's good because it flags you know, people and, and, and collectors. How, collectors how can we have more collectors in that field? So well, we need to have you know, people talking like I'm doing today, uh, having also photographers explaining what they do. Uh, we need a couple of, you know, for, Crypto art, we have this Beeple moment. 
you know, Correct. in March 2021. So I suspect that at some point we'll have this Beeple moment with NFT photography, when all of a sudden an NFT photographer will sell his or her artwork at Christie's or Sotheby's or whatever at a price that is like Cindy Sherman or, 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 or the likes. And then it will put the spotlight into NFT photography. And just like we had you know, a lot of people joining the, the NFT space as from March or April 21, we'll have the same. And we'll have two categories. We'll have uh, three categories. We'll have the PFP you know, NFT collectors, mm. I would call them, that will come. We'll have the traditional you know, photography collector, analog, that will join. And we have also the, the crowd, you know, the, the, the one that are on Instagram that will eventually join because they like the photo. So, so I have two questions on that. Do you, do you think that is the role also of these institutions such as Paris Photo, for example, to bring more knowledge and education about NFT? Question one. And question two, do you think uh, for more collectors who are already in the NFT space, we are lacking, uh, we really miss a, a proper secondary market to bring them more? Oh, I, I will begin by the last one, uh, secondary, yes. By definition, um, NFT photography, apart if you do editions, so actually I'm advising a lot of, you know, uh, advising, like softly advising, you know, uh, photographer I know to do editions, mm. uh, because I think it's a good way for them to expand their footprint, to have more collectors, because not everybody can, you know, buy, uh, and actually I, I bought one of your editions, actually. You did. Um, and not all the collectors can actually purchase, can afford to buy, you know, uh, at five or 10 or, or, or this kind of price in terms of ease. Um, and having an edition is a good way to expand your footprint as a, as a photographer. And then also because if eventually you buy two, you know, that, let's, say, let's say that you bought uh, 30 editions, you buy two because you are a collector and you, you, you are a bit of speculator, then you can keep one for you. And after that, you can sell, you know, the other one after. And then, it creates liquidity, for you it creates royalties, mm. so it's quite positive. So for me, editions are probably a way to expand the footprint of NFT photography. So that's something I'm supporting, and I'm buying, you know, all the, all the photographers I know that, that do that, I, I buy their, I buy their, their editions. Um, Whatever the price, if someone does an edition uh, at one ETH. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's, funny enough, we had this conversation the other day on Twitter with uh, Guido and, uh, and a couple of other photographers, which is, you know, how you price an edition compared to one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. And it's a complex topic. Because, it really uh, is. You know, but it's, it's, another, it's, it's a panel. It's, a it's panel another also. panel. Um, voilà, so that's the first question. Uh, and, you, and institutions like Paris yeah. Photo, these, uh, these huge museum, museum, conferences, or, or, or exhibition, they, they, they will come, you know, they have to. And actually, traditional will come because they have to, you know, mm. and, and uh, because people are waiting for that. And also because when you look at, you know, the price of the, of the NFT photography, actually, it's not, not so small, you know? Yeah. And so, no, they will come. But again, I, I, I'm expect, I'm waiting, I'm looking forward to this people moment for NFT photography. Will it happen in one month, two months, five months, six months? I don't know. That's great. You know, it, it's, it's maybe that Elon Musk will fall in love with a photography by Mona Lisa and, and, and all of a sudden it will go like 50, 100 ETH and, and it will change everything. That's all I, I wish for you. Uh, do we have some questions from the audience before we end up here? I don't know if we have a mic for, for the audience. Yeah, the mic is coming. One here. Can you guys raise your hand, those who have? Yeah, coming. It's coming, I guess. Uh, good morning. I don't even know if I need this mic. It's not that many. Uh, first of all, how you doing, Jan? It's good to see you. Hello, Fidel. Uh, Jean-Michel, it's a pleasure to meet you finally. And Monaris and Nina, sorry for the sunglasses. <laughs> Had a late night on Portuguese wine, enjoying Lisbon. Uh, uh, I just have a, I have a base question, I guess, with kind of a full answer, so please don't feel free to, to go off on a tangent about it. But um, I found a little success for myself in uh, black and white photography, in one-of-ones and collections on OpenSea. And I'm curious, uh, I was curious about trying to challenge the, the PFP aspect of the NFT space. Uh, not that it's lesser art, you know, because someone does have to produce that art, but it is the 5,000, the 10,000, you know, seeing that product go at that, at that, that, spade, that, that speed and that, that quantity. Do you believe that photography in the NFT space can, like you said before in series or, or, or many different one of ones, that it can challenge that PFP space and kind of sort of give photographers who maybe are in a one-on-one setting or in a series setting 
another medium and another avenue with which to put their work out there. And this is, I guess, as a collector's point of view for Jean-Michel, but also from an artist's point of view, would you be interested in going into something that big, or is this staying in a one-of-one -one area something that you would be more interested in? So from, um, I, I don't want to necessarily have the competition between PFPs and, and, um, and NFT photography, because I think that those are two different things, and I think that people are not coming for the same kind of, uh, in the same purpose, you know? I think that PFPs, there is obviously speculation, but there's about being part of communities, there is membership, there's a couple of, you know, other things than beyond the quality of the art. I have a, a funny sto personal story, which is my, my daughter who, 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 who has been with me like on NFT and she was looking at what I was buying and she kept on saying to me, you know, but why have you bought this very ugly ape, you know, mm -hmm. that happened to be the bored ape. Uh, by the way, that, you know, most of my collection of NFT, that's because I sold an ape and a serum uh, five months ago, right? So, <laughs> voila. Nice. But the, so the point is, um, I think that those two are, are, are kind of so far too different, but my kind of feeling is that we have to learn from the PFP because there are some you know, mechanics behind you know, the, 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 the community management, the membership. Utility. The utility. Mm. Uh, you know, maybe that when you buy an NFT photography, you can have uh, inside that, I would say, uh, a dinner you know, with the artist included. Uh, or entry with uh, the MoMA once you've got your, your collection exhibited there. This kind of thing, Fidel. So I, I think it, we can learn, but again, we are very early, you know? We are so early, we have so many things to learn uh, as a collector, but also as an artist, and I think that's what probably also uh, is, you know, very fascinating for you guys to, to be in there because you are there to, to create something new. Absolutely. Like, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love PFPs. One of the reasons why I love that is because once you sell it, you have enough profit to support more photographers, right? And I think for most collectors, that's, I mean, I would hope that that's what they do. They sell like an ape, <laughs> and then they're like, okay, let me support 10 photographers today. One thing that I, that I have learned from PSP is what you just mentioned, utility. I remember selling um, one of my photos, and I included a uh, photo walk in New York City with the collector. Um, we did a three hour photo walk and it was just me and him, you know, and I was t uh, telling him about street photography and teaching him about a camera. So it, it did, it, it, it's like, okay, what can I give you instead of just one photo? What else can I provide? And that's something that I've learned um, with PFP. So it, I, I think they're, they're great and they're essential right now to create, especially to, to get some profit to support other, other artists. Do we have more time for one last question maybe? I think I have one here. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, so you were talking about how Instagram has to change as in some, to represent all these NFTs you're bringing in. So what exactly does that mean? So is it gonna be, um, a marketplace, like how can I differentiate right now when I see a normal photo or a NFT photo? Alors, from a technical angle, it's very simple. Uh, you know, NFT is all about ownership and proof of authenticity and origin. So it's as simple as that. And as Ina said, you know, on Instagram, mm. original photo has been posted by Ina maybe some months ago on Instagram, and then people they did the right click save and they share that without quoting her. In, an, in NFT, you know, you can do that, you can still click save, but right click save, but the real ownership and the real authenticity needs to be proven and needs to be owned by someone. And it needs to be owned by the creator or again by the collector. Mm. So for me, I don't really see, well, I see, huh, they, they can redo OpenSea. <laughs> Basically, and they list, you know, and you decide to list your photo on that, and then you display that everywhere, and people share that because they like it. Voilà, that's what they can do. But eventually, again, I don't really know, I, I know technically how they can do it, but I don't know how philosophically they can go into that because they are Web2 and, and they want to centralize everything. So, again, I, I, I really don't see how they can go fully decentralized. But that's just my, again, that's just my personal take. That's not, you know, um, a general view of the company or whatever. Thank I you have so no much. idea what they're going to do because uh, 
Well, we're not inside of Instagram, we're but uh, when you go on Instagram now, you have uh, uh, regular <laughs> profiles, but you <laughs> also have uh, marketplaces. <laughs> so sometimes you see photographs in the marketplaces that looks like uh, you know any other photo, but uh, you when you touch the when you touch it, or sometimes it just appears. You have the price of. Uh, of you know the item that is uh, being sold, so maybe they might have something like that, like a special marketplace in the app. But for now, I'm just curious on how they are going to manage to separate and uh, make it clear that these are NFTs. And uh, well, I guess we'll see sooner than later. Well, thank you to the three of you. It's time to close this panel. Thank you so much. I think we can applause the three guests today, and uh, I'll leave the session to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I don't know, I think we... Hi. <laughs> Should we wait a little bit or... We can go, John? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, super happy to be here today. Um, I'm uh, Brian Sisak, CEO of Screenshot. Super happy to present to two people for today that to talk about the topic of play to earn, to play and earn. Um, we have uh, two amazing people today, Julien Boutlou and Tommy White from Blackpool and Married Cycle, one of the two uh, coolest guild into the space right now. Or, I mean, like, you guys gonna describe yourself what you are. Um, so, uh, super happy to, to present you guys today, super happy to interact with you. I'm gonna try to just ask you some questions about what's going on in the space. I do myself a little bit of game as well, so I'm gonna try to ask you how do you guys perceive the things and how do you guys invest and what, are, what do you think are maybe the trends in, your in the future for, for our space and uh, specifically with the new things going on and everything. Uh, but maybe, maybe I think one cool thing could be just to, for you guys to present Merit Cycle to me and uh, Blackpool for you, uh, Julien. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Merit Circle. Merit Circle is a, a fairly integrated gaming DAO and um, most people know the guild aspect probably, so that's one of the activities we have. Um, basically, we are trying to facilitate uh, different utilities in the game for space, and um, that's um, something we're very excited about, and um, I can tell a lot more about uh, when you hit me up here. <laughs> yeah, so myself, uh, Julian Butalu, I've been in the space for uh, quite some time. Uh, celebrate my 10 years anniversary uh, last year and uh, started with the Bitcoin industry. Um, so Blackpool is, um, compared to other guild like Merit Circle, uh, all this, we very focus on quantitative um, aspect of the NFT market. So the team, so it's a, it's a hedge fund, a VC, where we invest in the NFT market. We have deployed approximately 25 million US dollars in the, in the market in the NFT. We are a uh, leader in some verticals such as Sorare. Uh, we also like in, in, inside like Axie Infinity, Comet. So basically we deploy capital and then we uh, manage the capital uh, to make the maximum uh, return. Uh, we call it like legally rewards. So we have a bunch of scholars as well. Uh, but our focus is really on the mathematics 
um, aspect of the market. So we analyze the market, we analyze the trend. We also like uh, make market making, um, arbitrage um, into the market of NFTs. We truly believe that the NFT market currently, um, even if it's focused on JPEG and, and, and images, will move into uh, physical, like traditional finance, so debt, bonds, and all different things. Cool, super cool. And maybe could you both give a little bit of uh, the scope of investment that uh, you just did it a little bit, but maybe Tommy about like Merit Cycle, how yeah. much you invest guys, and, and as well about the scholarship. Maybe not, not everyone maybe is aware here about what is a scholarship, maybe, but could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, I think what connects most guilds now is uh, the gamer side of things and specifically the scholars. So that's by virtue of Axie being one of the few play to earn economies at scale. Um, because of that, most of the play-to-earn economy uh, uh, focused guilds are usually scholar-centric guilds. So most of them, even if they do different things, they all have a scholarship model and that's basically uh, for the people that are not aware with that, where um, a player um, rents an NFT uh, from the DAO, so the, the DAO lends it out to the player and he starts playing with that NFT and he can earn revenue. A part goes back to the guild, often a DAO, not always a DAO, and then a part is retained by the player. And that allows the player to make a nice earning. Now there's many different models that you could envision here where a player is uh, contracted by a DAO and then plays in another game. So that's the guild part. Um, and I think that's what most guilds are known for and most guilds have risen to prominence with. But now you see like these guilds, it's sort of a too broad of a term because some guilds, I mean, in a way you could even see um, esports teams as highly specialized guilds on the, on the very competitive side. But like something Julian is doing is more on the, on the quantitative side. And then for example, what most guilds are doing is very much on the gaming side, on the scholar side. Um, facilitating those players. And what we are doing uh, with Marriage Circle um, is we basically, we have that. And there we try to expand into other kind of strategies. So beyond XE, but we also have four other verticals. One is the investments arm. And um, I think just to give some color there, so um, you can have different strategies within the gaming vertical. So where you basically use the players and their time and employ them to uh, do certain strategies, they make a nice uh, profit, some is retained by the guild and the DAO, and sometimes there are some more synergies there where you can also earn the guild token. <laughs> but then on the investment side, uh, for us, so that would be a different vertical, is where we basically just look for the best early stage uh, investments in GameFi projects. And Specifically with the lens of projects where we think, okay, this is both a nice investment because we think it will be an interesting game five project that we want to see succeed, but also because uh, there is potential that long term they could also be a partner in the gamers vertical, like a game like Axie. I mean, if you had that in a very early stage, there was no scholarships yet, but if you invested and then over time you could also become a partner in the gamers vertical. We also um, invest in crypto assets. We actively do yield farming strategies, basically just everything to optimize our treasury for the best returns because we try to make this a very holistic thing where all verticals add to each other. So they all have synergies to each other that make um, the value to the end users in each independent vertical uh, better. And uh, just very briefly, so we also have the Marriage Studios. This is where we incubate games. So that's where a game could come to us. Uh, in a very early stage, they either don't have the community or they don't have certain expertise um, that we have. So they try to leverage the expertise of the DAO and launch their game through the DAO. And then there's different models. Sometimes it's very much, it becomes a marriage circle game. Sometimes it's more like a co-owned game. And then um, just to finish the train, it's not really important for this discussion, but we're doing the NFT marketplace and that will also tie into the other infrastructure. Um, but yeah, just so in terms of investment, it's very broad. Like we try to uh, service the whole GameFi industry and the gamer side of things. So that's the scholar side of things. That's where we try to create the strategies. That's where we try to create a huge diversity among strategies. 
but it's also um, investing in these other verticals. And so j just, to, just to make it simple for everyone, maybe, and really quickly, I don't know if you have those numbers in mind, and I will go to the play tour and, and play learner just after that, but c could you just give us, uh, like Fondement Julien, a, a, a split percentage of the investment that you guys do at Blackpool? Like if you speak about games, arts, uh, whatever, every, anything else that you can do, just, just to give just a little bit of difference maybe between Merit Cycle and Blackpool, so just so that people understand uh, what you know, the, your actually uh, investment goes to. Right now, yeah. Um, I think we are pretty much the similar uh, business model on, on a few different aspects um, on the investment and also the incubations. Um, I would I would say that people usually see those kind of like Blackpool Merit Circle and other uh, um, fund or uh, guild management uh, project as competitors, but I would say it's actually the opposite. We um, um, we're here to, to grow the space, and, and, uh, and the more people like us entering the space, then it makes the, the market uh, sustainable, and, and also like price discovery mechanism, being able to, to buy on, on, a, on a market certain NFTs or finding price flow and all different things. Um, I think we have, because we started with gaming uh, two years ago, with Sorare, um, and then we expand into uh, multiple different games like comets and uh, like spaceships and all different things. We have uh, um, Guild of Guardians, Illuvium, uh, all the different big projects. And as mentioned, we joined some of those projects as uh, a pre seed or seed investment. Um, so I would say that we spend like 50% of our activity in the investment side, uh, and then the rest we have our own school. We have an academy, we have a studio, uh, we also have um, 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 a scoots uh, program and incubations. Um, so obviously the, 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 the goal is to uh, have a percentage of market shares, of the, uh, a percentage of the shares of the market, doing all the different um, system uh, alongside of the investment arm is to attract a new um, yeah, either like new builders, people that want to build a project or people want to participate in the ecosystem of the NFT, then we are trying to, be in, to build structure for them uh, to onboard them into the fund. Um, how many people are playing games or are using NFTs in the ecosystem or just alongside, not speculation, not buying NFT, but actually using those NFTs to do something? Okay, and how many people are part of a guild? It's actually a few of them, yeah. So the difference is like you see like in the, in the room, maybe 10% of people uh, are using the NFTs and like 10% or 5% are actually part of a guild. The thing is like if you have NFTs as uh, investment because you believe in a the project, then you, you should be correctly incentivized to use those NFTs. And the best way to use them uh, if they are yield generating or yield bearing asset, or you can use them inside the game and then earn um, passive rewards, uh, you can do it yourself, but then it requires time. Or you can join a guild like Merit Circle or like Blackpool, and then we'll uh, make sure that we bring the best uh, return uh, of those uh, assets that you bought. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, I would say like 50, 60% is investment, so we have an investment arm that invests in the ecosystem, seed, pre-seed, and join uh, different projects. And then we also try to build alongside of those different assets that we acquired and those projects that we are supporting, uh, trying to build academy, um, like a school uh, system for people to join and, and, and participate in this uh, growing ecosystem. Cool, okay, cool. So I hope it's better clear for everyone. Just I would like to know who does know what means play to earn here? Okay. Yeah, we should have started, but yeah. <laughs> uh. So basically, maybe just to give you a little bit of intro, I'm just going to give you a little bit one. But last summer, Axie Infinity made a huge apparition on, on the scene. It's a well known like, startup that started like in 2018, I think. And they started to initiate this process of being able to play into a game, earn a token and being able to generate revenue, as you said, passive revenue, while actually spending time using the NFTs into a game, right? So this created a huge 
paradigm shift, I would say, into the space, specifically in the game industry, right? Where we saw these movements of being a, seeing these capabilities for people that have the NFT to generate revenue over time. And, and now we're going to get into the hard, a little bit of hard things. But so now today that we are a little bit of six, seven months, eight months after X Infinity this summer, we saw you know, this huge tendency uh, with the, this huge bump uh, in, in the summer. What do you actually guys, do you guys think about the future of play to earn the way it is right now? I think if you speak specifically to play to earn, I, th I think I think we can f start with the play to earn maybe at first, right? And uh, and maybe you, you can say say what you think about the play and earn maybe. Uh, after. Yeah, I think I think it will be useful to um, maybe talk about the terminology because a lot of this I think um, gets confused with each other. So uh, everything was play to earn three months ago, like almost game five, which is a much broader stack was analogous, analogous with, with play to earn. And now, all of a sudden, um, play to earn is dead, supposedly, and everything is play and earn. And play to earn is not relevant anymore because it's not sustainable. Um, I don't think that's true. Uh, I do think that uh, both are, like, lumping them in with one on the, or the other is always wrong. It's, it's a much more uh, nuanced, nuanced picture. It's, you can almost envision it like a spectrum, I think, where you have um, play to earn. And in that sense, I do think that play and earn is a better representation of the middle. Because if you see it like play to earn, maybe even work, and then you have here, you have in the middle play and earn. You have um, play and spend, and then you have spend to play. And this is very much something we know from Web 2, but I don't think it will be something that won't be seen in Web 3. But I do think it will be more like the, the center of gravity will be more towards this side of the play to earn, play and earn. Because even if you think, um, for example, if, if someone uh, chops wood in the real world and he's, he sells that to someone that wants to build a house, so he sells, he, he uses his time and he sells something valuable to someone to build a house. Then, I mean, that's valid in the real world, and we call that work. But I think if, if the same thing were to happen in the metaverse, in the digital realm, and you have the, um, something analogous to, to chopping wood, or maybe even actual digital wood, um, and, and you, you sell it to someone uh, to build the equivalent of what is valuable or seen as a house in the metaverse, then I think all of a sudden now we would call it uh, play to earn, or maybe even play and earn, when in fact it's, it's uh, not different from work. So I think work is probably on the far end of that left spectrum. It will also exist in the digital realm. Then there's, I would say, play to earn is somewhere in between play and earn and work, because it's more you have some fun while you do it, but it's still probably not as enjoyable as just playing and not caring about how much you earn, but earning something on the side. And a bit farther, you have, you have play and spend. You, you play um, and you spend, but you mostly care about the fun and that you have to spend all right. You, you take that, um, you, you're happy to pay that because <coughs> you're having fun. And then there, on the far end of that spectrum is, is spend to play. And it's where you have to spend to play. And some people don't care, like people, spend a lot of money on a lot of things for, uh, just because it's enjoyable. And I think that uh, all these categories will and should exist in the digital realm. So we can talk about all of them. Play and earn is probably a good representation of the middle, but they will exist. They will all be relevant. Uh, I think both play to earn and play and earn will even be very significant. Work will also be very significant in the digital realm. And um, I think it's more useful to think about it as a spectrum. Uh, than to lump them in. And uh, I do also think that the games actually, or the worlds or ecosystems that will be most successful, will facilitate to all these layers. So a balanced economy should probably have all these layers. And I, there, there's also a matter, and not to make it too complex, but then there's also an aspect of perspective, obviously, like to the same player, uh, something could be work or something could be uh, uh, spent and play 
for example, if I'm, if I'm breeding axes um, and I'm selling them, and I take zero joy in it, like, and I think because those are the two main dials. You have, you have the earn aspect, how much I can earn, and how much I'm enjoying it. And if I take zero joy or I even hate it, it's, it's basically work. I'm, I'm just doing it to earn. But another guy could do the exact same things, but it's, it's the best thing in his life. Like, he's super happy doing it. So then, all of a sudden, it's play and earn. But another guy could breed, and he's breeding, but on the other side, he is spending more to do his breeding. So he cares more about the breeding because he's getting a lot of fun out of it, but he's not making money on that. He's a net spender, and that suddenly makes him play and spend. So there's also a perspective question there, but um, just to summarize, it's, it's very nuanced, and I think all of these five, and I just arbitrarily made them up, so there's maybe 10, and maybe they have different names, but they all exist, and they all should exist, and they all will exist because it is not different from uh, our economy here. We have a layered economy. It will just look very different because the rules are very different. There's no, uh, we don't have the same physical laws as we have here. So that's how I would think about it. Oh, cool. super interesting to have this perspective of the spread. I didn't, uh, I didn't saw that before. What do you think, uh, Joe? Uh, yeah, I won't spend, uh, but like a lot of minutes. Uh, I think for me, it, more like devil advocate. I think this is like a lot of terminology and a lot of. Uh, like um, for me, there is like there was a there was a boom. There was an I, I like NFT like the, like the ICO boom. There was the NFT craziness. We can call it like multiple layers. I don't believe uh, in this kind of like long speech uh, for the ecosystem of what we're trying to like trying to build. I think that the, the economy is moving into something like like utility, and that's it. Uh, there won't be any more further game that will pay people to play for something that is boring. Uh, they won't exist anymore because the market is maturing into something more stronger and uh, people will play games because they love it and at the same time they will get paid or they will earn uh, to play. But saying that we'll still see games that pay people to play something that is boring and shit, I don't believe in this. Okay. Uh, so I truly believe that because we have more people from the gaming industry that are coming and are very strong and they know how to build games. Before, the people that build those games didn't know how to build games. So what they did, they did an inflation of a token to pay people to play those games to make money. But those people were kind of forced to, make, to, to play. They were not playing for pleasure. They were playing because they were making money. And the, how it was built, most of those games, kind of like a Ponzi, is like the more you play, the more you earn those tokens, and those tokens have value, they have value because people buy them. And then the question is like, who's at the end is going to be dumped? You know, that's the reality of the, of the market. And now we're moving into utility, and that's it. Like, people that truly build game for pleasure, like, um, P, like FIFA, like, like all those games, huge industry gaming, they will provide game for people to play, and people will enjoy them. And there's no reason why people will play shit games and to get paid for playing those shit games. Because at the end of the day, if you can have pleasure to play and get paid, that's it. So all those kind of like huge utopia about the market or NFT, I don't believe in this. Okay, super interesting. Yeah. And, and actually, in terms of timeline, what do you guys actually think in terms of like, today we know that there is like a lot of efforts that are, that are going to be made with, through the investment that has been made into the gaming industry to move towards this uh, play, maybe and earn perspective. But uh, how many times do you think it's going to take to be able to reach this maturity of utility, which is actually enjoyable for people to play and earn money at the same time? Yeah. Um, sorry, can you repeat the last part again? I can, I right, can. right now, you know, we are still in the early phase of mm -hmm. this transition towards bringing to the people that play games that initially that were not enjoyable are going to move towards uh, this like high-end game development right. perspective, and we are going to, uh, as well, link to this, to, to this aspect, the earning aspect, but uh, how, how long do you think it will take to the industry to, as, for example, when we pass from the pay-to-play to, -play to uh, the free-to-play industry, and right now we are moving maybe to this play and earn uh, part, uh, how long do you think it, it's going to take right now for, because we have new game studio, like my company and everything that we try to go in the research and development to be able to do that. But the big ones are a little bit afraid to move into this space right now as well. So how long do you think it's going to take? Uh, I, I don't know. I know there is no good answer to that, but uh, you know, what is your perspective? 
It will, it will ha not happen. Um, it, it will happen by force, and it should happen by force. Like it's, um, it's, it's not going to happen because there's just for those big game development companies and the established games, there's just too much risk to venture into uh, something experimental with NFTs, um, linking themselves to Web3. There's a huge PR problem still, like NFTs are analogous with, with something bad, dirty, don't touch. Like, and that, but in my opinion, that's pure misinformation. So with information and with time, that will be solved. But at this point, there's very little incentive for a a big game to move into play and earn, play to earn, because they have their walled garden, they have a great business model, and um, anything they do outside of it, it could be a great move, but they also risk this great thing, what they have. Uh, so, I mean, they will just sit and wait, and at some point, other great games that are either Web3 native or incorporated because they want to compete in that way, competition will drive them that way. And then probably they will start with some subsidiary just to sort of do a test balloon. Uh, but it will happen in terms of yeah, how long. It's, it's very hard to say. I would, if I would have to put a number on it, I think it could uh, happen relatively fast. Uh, but you will have to at least, like, because if, you're, if your uh, thesis is that it will be the Web3 games that should do the disruption, and most of them have started building now. And to build great games, you need at least two years, probably four years. So I would say it's, it's four, six, four to six years out. But in the next four years, you will already see a huge transition. And in this next four years is where you see the interesting pieces taking shape. It's been interesting. Uh, I've seen them the opposite. Uh, it's already happening. Uh, all the uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, when we were investing in different games, uh, there were no mention of big uh, game uh, industry, like uh, players. But now, like recently, we joined some round and then a tab table, uh, cap table. There were like uh, Electronic Arts, uh, Ubisoft, like either like subsidiary of those uh, uh, big gaming industry, and they invest in. So if you see like all the uh, marketing, fashion industry, like uh, and all the brands, Adidas, Nike, all the different things, they're trying to join into the metaverse now. So in the NFT gaming industry, the only thing, they are jumping into the NFT, like they're already investing in those different uh, games, and they might do some acquisitions, like this year or next year. So they're already like, investing a lot of money. Uh, I would agree uh, with you that uh, the only issue is regulatory issue. So um, how can you make um, the, the... So having NFTs in your game, then it's super simple. I think we'll be playing, like for example, Ubisoft, that was like... Um, uh, Ghost Recon, uh, this game where you are like, depending on your profile, leaderboard, you could actually receive some NFTs. The only issue right now is like, regulatory uh, uh, wise, you cannot really uh, pay someone or like give something that adds value to the game. So NFT wise, they will, all the games that we'll be playing in, in a short term will have all those concepts of NFTs, having the blockchain, like powering the blockchain but you might not be able to sell them on secondary market. So you can only use them into the, the framework of the game or like into, for example, like um, the, the ecosystem. Uh, but it will change because of the acquisition of multiple different games and then having access to secondary market. So I think it's already happening. We don't see them. It's the same with traditional finance. They've been saying blockchain, Bitcoin, and all different things is bad. It's a scam. It's a fraud. But in the meantime, they've been investing billions, like millions of US dollars are being invested inside the industry of DeFi. It's exactly the same that is happening with, game, with uh, uh, the NFT gaming industry, but we're not aware of them. But believe me, on the cap table, they're there, they're investing, and they're trying to just like slowly but surely getting into the market because of regulatory framework, they cannot say publicly that they are participating in the NFT market. Super yeah. interesting. But I think there's um, a difference between investing and the point where will they choose to have an established game or ecosystem and fully embrace Web3. Like yeah, because, at what point would you yeah. say something like that would happen? Like a, a big title, like a, a FIFA, FIFA or Call of Duty or Battle Royale, yeah. like when would they be like, yes? Like, I think we have, when you have a company like Sorare, which is um, one of the biggest unicorn in Europe, uh, 3.5 or 4 billion US valuation, uh, FIFA, electronic sport, like all those big industry, 
they cannot let it, like, they, they have to join the, the world. Either they make acquisition of a game that is worth four billion, or either they acquire shares inside to become like the biggest shareholder. Uh, but right now, Sorare, football industry is one of the biggest markets in the gaming industry. Uh, they are licensing, buying license across the entire club of football. So I'm like, I know some guys like in, in, uh, in those like Ubisoft and all different things, it's making a lot of noise. Like not noise, but like um, they, they are talking about those things. Like it's, they cannot wait any longer. The only issue is the regulatory framework. So with Mika in Europe, those things passing, that is like a lot of questions, but maybe in Switzerland, maybe like, uh, so yeah, I, Maybe like two years, I would say, because of um, uh, central bank with stablecoin, when people and wallet users have the ability to spend money with stablecoin without thinking about understanding the concept of wallet, understanding the concept of Web3, then uh, those games will be able to like, make payments to the game with stablecoin and then at the same time buying assets uh, in the game through stablecoins. So it's already there. Uh, the only issue is like, do you, and also do we want as an industry to be because we're all saying like play to earn and play and earn, but I think it's also very scary because if inside the game you are paid to play the game, then we be, we entering like um, um, like a strange cycle, like a very dangerous cycle where you not only like people could make a lot of money, and I mean it's kind of like weird to say like if, for example you play FIFA like as a nine years old kid, you could make like millions. All those questions, like psychological questions, will come uh, in the industry, I think. Yeah. But I would say like two years, maybe. One, two years. Yeah. OK. So in, four year, in two years, we're going to see we can I hope so. together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, but thank you very much. I think it was awesome to be able to have your perspective on the market. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, or we can ask some questions to the, to the stage. Um, I'm good to take questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's go. Questions. Right, go ahead, guys. I don't know what you <laughs> a little bit of micro mic micro problematic. Morning. Hello, hello. Ah, yeah. Hello, good morning. And uh, very pleased to meet you. I was wondering about more a technical question, which is about um, so NFTs are in your wallet. So NFTs is about possession and owning them. Regarding the um, lending the NFT as a guild, so how does it proceed regarding the smart contract? How do you lend uh, NFT to the other person without losing the ownership? Thank you. Uh, can you repeat the question? Because I think I think your question was how do you give the NFT to a player without use, losing the ownership? Yes. Yeah. So um, for uh, in in the case of a guild. We would own the NFT, and then there is um, smart contract infrastructure to lend it out without giving away the rights of ownership. So they can just use the NFT, but they cannot transfer it. And um, well, that, that's the beauty of programmable money. That's like um, you can code this in. So that's actually, I think, something um, that is uh, very neat about this space. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would add like it's perfect uh, uh, like summarize of, of the, um, the way how you can interact with Guild. And that's the reason why you can scale rapidly because you remove the trust layer. And it's a trustless mechanism where you can onboard millions, thousands of people, scholars, uh, into a Guild without the need of trusting if the person is about to commit like something bad to, you, to, you, uh, uh, to, the, to the game, because we actually just give um, for them the ability to play the game without the ownership of the assets. And maybe it's interesting to know, is this infrastructure on your side, or is it provided by the game on their side? It depends, yeah, depends. It depends, like um, for Axie, it's, it's uh, provided on their side, but um, I know we are, and I imagine other guilds are working on uh, their own native infrastructure, and sometimes it's in cooperation with the partner game. We have a few partner games that we're working for direct integrations. Uh, for example, we're building out a dashboard that will be an overlay to partner games. And uh, we try to build direct integrations there. Uh, so it depends, but it, yeah, it's, uh, it's evolving and I think it's improving. 
Cool. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a good point. It's like, um, as a game, if you're building a game and not taking into consideration the uh, guild mechanism, you might shooting yourself in your own foot. Because the thing is like, as a guild, and in the industry, you have a lot of people that criticize what Merit Cycle or Blackpool Finance are doing because we have capital and we inject in the industry and people are saying like, we wealth and, uh, and we kill the little fish. I don't think this is true because in the capitalism world, you need uh, a way to scale capital across the industry. And uh, the guild mechanism for a game is very really nice, but you need to take into consideration how you can work. And I think there was a problem in Sorare, in the game, in the football fantasy game, how you mix guilds and how you mix normal players inside the game. And you have to think about cryptonomics. You have to think about how do you incentivize correctly people to build on your game and also people to play your game. And this is a little, it's a little bit tricky, but uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I think we could make another completely other panel on this topic. <laughs> uh, maybe one last question, and I think we're running out of time. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, um, so my question is, so before we had play to earn, so it was the first thing. Um, then we had move to earn uh, with uh, Stepen, which is making a lot of noise right now. Um, so basically we are trying to monetize everything, and we are trying to get as much users as we can, so they can do like whatever and get paid for it. So how do you see the end game? So is it going to be brief to earn, or how do you see the evolution of the whole paying for basically existing thing? Yeah. I, I don't think there, there's an end game. It's just it's going to be more. Like, there's going to be more weird things you can earn for. And um, different things will appeal to different people. And um, I think the more relevant question is maybe where do we want not the end game to be, but where do we want the gravity of the space to be? I mean, Julian alluded to it a bit, but you could envision a very dystopian future where all our kids that are, uh, should be productive members of society, they start playing games and they start playing weird loops that are important to them within ecosystems, but don't really make our world any better. Um, the way I think about it, because I, I think about that question a lot, like, does all the things I'm doing, that, like, like I'm, am, am I even moving the world in the right direction or I'm just building something that's not a net benefit? I think it's, um, I mean, the wheels of technology, they will go forward regardless. So we are moving to this digital realm whether we want it or not. And I think um, if you have that premise, uh, the only thing we can do, and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, responsibility, responsibility we have here, is how we shape that new digital realm, the metaverse. Like, what are we going to attribute value to? How are we going to shape the infrastructure to protect all different, different stakeholders? And I think that's something that's going to be a continuous progress, uh, like the real world. Like, it, it's evolved from, I mean, in medieval times, um, it, it wasn't as ideal. And we, we kept um, improving. But, I mean, in an, in an a different universe, the world might have looked much worse and in another much better. So I think there is an active role here in self-policing and thinking about how we shape this, how we address the negatives and how we empower the positives. Like what I think is the most positive, especially in the short term, is that we, um, we dissipate borders and we create equality opportunity. We give everyone the same financial infrastructure, the same financial opportunity. And by that, we unlock all this potential of six billion people, and we become a more connected world. And by becoming a more connected world, we are less inclined to have wars with each other because we all depend on each other. And if you unlock the potential of six billion people, you get four times the economic output that we have now, four times the innovation that we have now, four Elon Musks, four Steve Jobs. And I think that's, that's the net gain in the short term. It's not that play and earn or play to earn is going to solve this in the short term, but it's going to contribute to it. And I think in the long term, it's going to move there anyway, and we should see the best way to shape that space. Yeah, it's, uh, it's dangerous, uh, dangerous vision. Um, have you seen, uh, who's, who's, so, uh, who's seen the uh, uh, wrecked Opium Diaries, Dystopian Dreams, the video? Yeah, so, we entering this world, like, uh, and and I think we shouldn't 
we should really push for more regulation rather than fight regulation because regulation will, at the end of the day, help us draft uh, this ecosystem and this economy. Um, I don't think I want a world where any decisions or anyone I'm interacting with is actually paid and earned something. I, I'm, against, I'm against a vision like that. This is like too scary. And I think that will be a luxury in the future where you don't earn to do something. And there will be a luxury where if you go somewhere in hotel, if you travel somewhere, the people that you meet there are not actually earning anything. They're there because it's freedom and, and they're not earning anything or they're not incentivized to do such a decision. So in the gaming industry, it's already happening and that's the reason why I said that it's better to move into a pure utility uh, framework where you, you play by pleasure and not because of incentives mechanism. We have to find a threshold between, as a, as a society, what do we want to achieve? And uh, that's a good question. I think it's, um, it's, it's a dangerous path we, we uh, going towards. But as mentioned, uh, it's also like giving more opportunities for people in the world because it's kind of greedy to say that the world is, is, is perfect. Yeah, it's perfect for us living in a nice country in a safe environment. But across the world, you have many, uh, um, many things that are not uh, good for, 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 for people. And I think this is solving the problem, but at the same time, it's creating more issues. So building a better world, but not a perfect world. That's the thing, yeah. But we have to be aware of that as a, as a society, because this is the only way that we can make sure we don't go, um, we don't go towards the, the world. You know, like you mentioned Elon Musk, you mentioned other things. But at the same time, do you really want people like as a single entity? We say like decentralization. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. But now like a country of regulations, and I know we have people in this room like working regulations. At the same time, those people like states, governments, they're working for the people. The only issue is not them, it's the lobbying. Lobbying, pu pushing centralized entities like states to do things that they not necessarily want, but because they are uh, obliged to do. Uh, but in a world where we're moving, it looks like in crypto and decentralization, we're moving the power to single entities. Elon Musk, 20, like 60 million users, say something on Twitter and boom. So it's scary, like scary. And I think that's the reason why we need strong regulation, we need states, but regulation that help innovate, push for innovations. That's the thing, but don't go against regulation. We need to work with regulation because at the same time, they will help us to shape the world in a better, in a better stage, in a better shape, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. Thank you very much, Tommy. I think it was awesome. All right, boys.